Let's talk about entrepreneurship, success, and business strategies. One good idea executed voraciously is better than dozens of great ideas dabbled with. And I speak from experience. I love novelty. So I get really attracted to new ideas. But if I don't give myself a time limit to put it out, it starts to fester and it starts to become this looming, you know, <laughs> procrastination monkey that sits on my shoulder and doesn't go away. You only have so much time. So you're only able to push so many balls forward. And if you're pushing just one ball forward and you get to the finish line and find out it's not what you thought it should be, you have time to make adjustments. You have time to revise your idea, to iterate. You don't get that opportunity when you're spreading yourself too thin. So I encourage people to invest in whatever their best idea right now is, rather than trying to roll a bunch of balls very slowly up a hill. Some of them are just going to roll back down, maybe all of them. And a related thought is eclecticism kills greatness. If you don't know what eclecticism is, it's, uh, you know, just having a lot of, you know, sort of variety and quirkiness and diversity. Eclectic people attract eclectic friends. They're a fun hang, but sometimes they can't generate the concentration of connections that you need to achieve escape velocity towards your goal or towards your vision, especially if you're trying to do something ambitious. When you have a network, and not that every friend should be a network, but if you happen to have friends that came through work or university or other places that aren't as diverse, those people will help power you to success if your success is in a similar field. It's much harder to do the other way. Although you can make an argument, you can live a more enjoyable life. The difference being how ambitious is your goal and how focused is that goal and how much are you able to do with pure business relationships and networks versus friendships. Because it's very hard to subdivide your time among both groups. Some people who have an ambitious goal, especially if it's one they know early, will dedicate their entire 20s and 30s to doing nothing but getting to that goal. And they don't get to the, those eclectic friends and those hangouts till their 40s or maybe 50s or maybe never. I'm not saying everyone should be that ambitious. Everyone should want to conquer the universe. But if there is even an artistic goal or some sort of um, personal one that you want to accomplish and be great at, realize that the more people you have around you that share that same passion, the more fuel you'll have in the tank to get to that place. Lewis Howes, who's kind of a, I guess he's a business self-help guy, uh, he posted, you are the average of the five people you associate with most. So don't underestimate the effects of your pessimistic, unambitious, or disorganized friends. If someone isn't making you stronger, they're making you weaker. Actually, that's a quote from Tim Ferriss. And I agree. And heads must roll. If you have those kinds of people in your life, people who are pessimistic, are unambitious, most cannot be rehabilitated because look, you have to find the bright spot in things. You have to try. You have to get up off the floor. You can't go pointing at other people, hating on other people. By the way, that is the greatest clue to whether you're friends with a loser. It's someone who's always looking at what the other person has. They're not internalizing saying, hey, what can I do to get the things that I want? But they're always judging, how does this person have all of this? And it's okay if it's a passing thought, but if it's a pattern, you're dealing with a loser. And I hate to call people losers and I hate to be dismissive of people. But if you have that kind of pattern, if it's someone that you truly deeply care about, you need to try to rehabilitate them. You have to. But if it's you know someone you don't have a commitment to, you might need to cut them loose. So this guy, Patrick Bed. 
David. Uh, he has a really good YouTube channel, which I strongly recommend. He made the argument that an entrepreneur is the same as an intrapreneur. The only difference is, according to him, is one put up money while the other didn't, which, by the way, is a big difference. The intrapreneur thinks, works, pivots, adjusts, behaves just like the entrepreneur. Before jumping into entrepreneurship, first try intrapreneurship. I've been on both sides. I've been an entrepreneur in a lot of corporations, and I've become an entrepreneur when I left. They're very different, and I would actually introduce a little bit more nuance. And this is from an article I wrote called Employees Are From Mars, Entrepreneurs Are From Venus. And I broke them up into four different groups. The four groups are small business owners, startup founders, corporate employees, and I'm including entrepreneurs in that, and freelancers slash influencers, people who work independently. So let's go through some of the differences because I think they're interesting and worth discussing. The small business owner's strength is satisfaction. It's like, I built this. I put everything on the line. I did the best I could. Chances are they didn't have some sort of great formal education or powerful network or lots of money. That's not always the case, but usually. And they did the best they could to build that flower shop or to build that restaurant, whatever it is that they built. So there's that pride and satisfaction. The weakness often is that they're tethered to this thing. It's very hard to take a vacation. Uh, there's usually not family who could help out. They can't get great help because they're not generating enough money oftentimes to hire the best people. So they always have to kind of be supervising it. It's a very tricky type of satisfaction. You have the freedom of not having to work for someone else, but you're tethered to this thing because you have all that accountability. The opportunity is guidance and capital. With those two things, a lot of mid-range entrepreneurs or ones maybe even on the verge of failure can really become great. The biggest threat to them is scale. I've seen so many bite off more than they can chew, especially prematurely, and they fail. It's a very difficult thing to decide when it's okay to grow, when you have the right model, the right opportunity. And you see it a, a good show to watch. It's called The Profit. And this guy goes around, I think it's on CNBC, he goes around to all these small businesses trying to help them. And you see how broken they are and how often they have locations that are unprofitable. So it's, it's a very tricky thing and a lot of that can be addressed with guidance and knowledge. Startup founders, their strength is they dream big, they think big, and that is admirable. We need people like that in our society. Even if sometimes that dream is very self-serving, Oftentimes, they can't get there without providing a product or service someone else needs. The weakness is they've got a lot of hubris. They are not very coachable. They're very stubborn. Oftentimes, they're very young, and they don't know what they don't know. And uh, they're going to make a lot of mistakes because of that hubris. And maybe that's okay. That's, that's a good time to make those mistakes when you're young. Their opportunity is having some perspective listening more, not to people who are going to tell them not to do certain things or to talk them down, but give them insights about the market that they're pursuing, the thing that they're disrupting. There are things they don't know. I've been approached so many times with ideas that I've evaluated half a dozen times before when I was in corporate uh, because someone thinks it's novel to them. So it's important to do that homework and to get that perspective from people who've worked in the industry or, uh, you know, mature strategic thinkers who can help guide them to that better place. And the threat is other people's money. They are dependent on investors who all get a board seat, who all have a say, and eventually that thing that you thought you started that was yours is not yours anymore. And you see some companies have the leverage to retain control, like Mark Zuckerberg. He had two classes of shares where he basically controls all the voting shares. That's very rare. Most companies don't have that kind of leverage. So you end up oftentimes losing control of your, your own vessel that you've built. Corporate employees have a different profile. Their strength is stability. They have the comfort of knowing the check is coming every two weeks and they've got a 401k plan and they've got other people who can cover for them if they go on vacation. The weakness oftentimes, and it's certainly something I found when I was working in corporate, is meaning because 
the thing is so big, your contribution is so small relative to the size of the organization. And yes, yeah, sometimes you can work on you know really big projects or, or new launches, but there are a lot of people who feel like they're just caught in the middle of a lot of PowerPoints and a lot of administrative work. And it could be very bad for the ego. The opportunity is tangibility, having something that they produce, that they can show other people, I did this, I made this. And because so much of our economy is service economy or pretty much esoteric, it's very hard to hand someone something, say, hey, I made this chewable pet. I don't know why I just said that, but whatever it is that you made, there's that pride in physicality. And not every business has that, but every manager and every organization should try to give people as much tangibility as they can. And the threat is security. So stability and security are the yin and yang in this equation because that security is also ball and chain. That's what keeps you from leaving. That's what keeps you from innovating. That's what keeps society from benefiting from the innovations that they can put together because there are a bunch of people I personally know who are staying for the health benefits because their family wouldn't, wouldn't be covered otherwise because it's gotten so expensive or because, you know, they don't want to lose that 401k match or whatever is vesting in the next year. So... These tethers, I think companies think are working in their favor, but what they end up doing is imprisoning a lot of people in mediocrity. And that mediocrity doesn't help the individual and it doesn't help the corporation. It's better to set them free. The other kind of person, the freelancer or influencer, their strength is their independence. They don't have to manage a team. They don't have to manage a salary. They're on their own. They're out there doing their thing. They're charging you know, an hourly rate to be a professional, whether they're a lawyer or a graphic designer or whatever it is. The weakness is security. They don't have that. So when they're trying to sell a project or they're on vacation or they go to a conference, nobody's earning, nobody's working. So it's, it's a really stressful kind of situation for a lot of people. And they also have to do all their own billing and all their administration. And that eats up a lot of time and doesn't earn them anything. The opportunity is leverage and leverage can come in a lot of different forms. It could be financial leverage, which is something I do in my business. So in my business, for example, in phase two, we do a lot of uh, partnerships between large and small corporations, typically startups, and we'll get a piece of that, you know, or some sort of bonus. Our interests are aligned, but also it creates upside that is well beyond what you could earn with an hourly rate. And also we've done success-based uh, work where we charge a lower fee, but we get a percentage of sales once something launches and goes to market. That's a way to create leverage in your business. Another way to do it is to partner up with other people who are doing the same thing or in the same business and create sort of like a virtual consultancy or something like that. And then you can uh, spread the workload a little bit more evenly. Someone does more business development, someone does more administration, someone does more delivery, and then you can create a little bit of breathing room for yourself and a little bit of coverage for when you want to take a vacation and go for a hike or, you know, shoot a bear. I, I Don't shoot a bear. What kind of person would do that? And the threat is commodification. A lot of independent freelancer categories are being automated. So if you look at 99designs, that's a perfect example. There's so many designers out there that are trying to compete for work, but you know there could be someone really talented in India or in Russia who's willing to do that job for a fraction of what you're willing to do. So what do you do? You move to Russia? <laughs> I don't know. But that's happening in a lot of categories. Um, video editing is another one. There's a bunch of people on Fiverr who'll charge you, I don't know, 20 bucks, maybe 30, 40 bucks. Here would cost you a few hundred for that same video edit. It's very challenging and it's very stressful, but they're very different profiles. They're very different psychologies. You know, startup founders, a lot of them, 
statistically are very young. They have great networks. They have great skills. They have rich parents. So it's a lot easier to take those risks compared to a small business owner who might be putting everything on the line and taking out a loan instead of just getting handed a ton of VC money. And if things don't work out, they're like, oh, I guess I guess I'll just go work for Google for 300000 Back to Patrick Bet David. He had a video, why millionaires get what they want. He suggested asking just one question. And that question is, do you know anyone who blank? You fill in that blank. What is it that you're trying to do? What is your goal? Who are you looking for in terms of partnership, in terms of customer, in terms of supplier? What is it that you need? And the more people you have that conversation with or ask that question to, the more seeds you plant. That doesn't mean that person will help you in that moment right away. They may not know somebody who has those things that you are looking for, but you've planted the seed in the back of their head and that's all you can hope for. Then the next time they run into someone, they're like, oh yeah, Steve's looking for a podcast co-host. Uh, maybe I can introduce him to this woman who has hosted podcasts and is really interested in business and futurism and philosophy and all these things, which by the way, I am interested in. So do you know anyone who would make a great podcast co-host? Let me know, steve at ideafactory.com. Anyway, that question can turn into real money. It was always hard to trust businesses that didn't rely on repeat customers uh, or a high frequency of purchase, like wedding vendors, right? You you buy one vet wedding dress, right? Unless you're Larry King, you're probably paying for eight or nine of them. But wedding vendors don't get a lot of repeat business, so they rely on word of mouth. Jewelers is another thing. You don't buy jewelry every day. Yeah, maybe if you're a Kardashian, but you're probably getting it for free. Tourist destinations, those guys can basically feed you dirt and worms and it wouldn't matter because they'll never see you again. Uh, and that's why you, tr you try to avoid those kinds of places in Times Square or wherever, you know, whatever the Times Square of your podunk village is. Car dealers is another one. You buy so infrequently, you buy, you know, once every few years or three or four years, whatever it is. Their sole motive to provide good service is professionalism. Hopefully they have some pride in what they're doing and self-respect to want to please people. And also word of mouth, which can go either way. And something I'd love to see and I haven't seen is how something like Yelp or social media dread has changed that. Now there is this check and balance, but it's not always a fair one because someone could have some petty notion and hold it against a business and put up a negative one-star review and that could drop their business by, you know, 20, 30, 40%, depends on the company, depends how many reviews they have. Uh, this thing is, frustrates me. I was in a Nordstrom rack trying to buy pants, which is very exciting because most people don't wear pants now. Uh, ask Jeffrey Tubin. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna use his uh, name as a punchline forever now. But uh, it seemed like everyone in line in front of me was either returning livestock or trying to securitize a CDO or some sort, sort of loan instrument. Businesses have to figure out a way to uh, get a fast line and a slow line going. The best one at doing this is Trader Joe's. They do a really good job of, you know, the 10 items or less or the the other general line. Although lately, since the pandemic, they've kind of cut the volume of people in the store, so they haven't had to do that. But experience right now is so important. When all these stores are cutting back, people remember their experience. And now there's not a lot of margin for error. Ask your customers for feedback and apply changes because they feel like they've been part of something and like they're being heard. When necessary, be invisible. Now, this is something I wrote a while back in an article, I think it was called 10 New Rules for Mobile Payments and Loyalty Startups, and that was on Forbes. The problem I found in a lot of companies I'd worked for, especially payment companies, they thought of what they offered as a product, which is a huge mistake. It is not 
a product and it is not the product. Your credit card is a conduit. It is a vehicle. It is an intermediary to get the thing you actually want. You want that vacation. You want that new iPhone. You want that new microphone for your podcast. You want the new laptop. That's what you really want. You don't want the card unless, I don't know, you've been starved of, of, of credit services and that's what you're looking for. And you're going to sit at home looking and staring at it, rubbing it and putting oil into it, you know, licking. Okay, it, it could get weird. That is not the product. The role of an intermediary is to be invisible. It's the same thing when you go to a restaurant. When you go to dinner the best kind of service is the service you didn't notice because it didn't interrupt your conversation. It didn't create all these awkward moments. Plates didn't start departing until you were done with them. Your water glass was always full and you never noticed a thing. If you're the intermediary, be invisible. Don't start thinking of yourself as the product to get people what they're actually looking for. KFC is selling a bucket of 10 pieces of chicken. And yet, in every photo of that bucket, all 10 pieces are fully visible. That is a miracle. Pyramids are less mysterious. The Sphinx is less mysterious. The, what, what's that thing in Ireland or Scotland? <laughs> the, the, the rocks that are stacked up on each other. Stonehenge, Stonehenge is less mysterious. And look, there are a lot of photos showing something to the contrary. I say, don't believe the lies. Don't believe the conspiracies. The magic bucket is real. The beauty of most digital businesses is that you should be able to improve the service and improve your profitability and never change the price. And so when companies still raise the price, you have to start wondering why. But the five that I came up with, first is maybe they're reinvesting in new capabilities and they need that extra capital to fund those new investments. So they're adding new uh, features or services or whatever. Another one is they have market power. They're just raising it because they can. Cell phone providers are notorious for doing that. Cable companies are notorious. I remember when I was with uh, Spectrum, which was Time Warner Cable before that, all they did was just invent new fees. They added no new service. It's the same box that was in there before, and now you have a rental fee on a box that you thought you had for free. You know, they just have monopoly power and they can raise prices to whatever it is until people start switching off. But where are they going to go if there's only one player to choose from? There could also be external growth pressure. Their investors could be pressuring them. Their, you know, the public markets, whatever it is, uh, could just be greed. Hey, we think we can. We think the customer can bear it and we're going to do it. And we don't care if we lose a few people because we've done the math and it's okay. We'll come out ahead. Or it just could be mismanagement because psychologically keeping that same price is really important to a lot of people. And they start to feel gypped if they're getting the same service, but now they're paying more and more and more for it. If you're a digital company or any kind of like virtual service, you should be able to increase your margins with efficiency, you know, get better servers, get automation. Yes, outsource, I guess. There are so many things you can do. Also, you know, storage gets cheaper every year. Uh, hardware gets cheaper. All of these things are improving. To the extent that you can, that is psychologically advantageous, unless you're really upping the value and that customer sees that value in the product. One thing I thought about that no one's really innovating is noise pollution. Everywhere you go, you know, whether it's the highway and the suburbs or certainly the city, no one's really working on that. And I know they have noise canceling headphones, but who is the hero who's gonna invent a really quiet fan or quiet air conditioner or some sort of silencer for subway tracks or traffic noise? or some sort of apartment soundproofing. I don't know, maybe it's because we don't value these things enough. We don't like visual pollution, but we'll accept noise pollution. We would be much more calm as people if there was less noise around us. Google is creating 
what I thought would have existed already. They're turning YouTube into a shopping site. So soon you're going to be able to click on products in the actual videos to go and buy them, which is a great idea. Quite frankly, it's an idea I talked about 15 years ago at MasterCard, a long time ago. Finally, the technology has caught up and it, we're able to do that. And I actually think there is a huge opportunity here. This is the melding of creativity and commerce. If you are in the business of selling products, it couldn't hurt to put out a how-to channel of some kind around those products and be able to sell them directly through that video. So I think this could be an interesting opportunity. I don't know for sure if YouTube has set uh, good pricing for it if it's implemented well, but it's something worth watching and I thought I'd flag it. And realistically, you haven't really made it until you have merch. Like I'll know I made it when you're wearing my name on your t-shirt. Now I've really made it when you're tattooing it, uh, you know, where you have a tramp stamp <laughs> with, you know, the McFuture on it or Steve Factor, which would be kind of weird, by the way. Don't put another man's name uh, there. <laughs> that never works out. I have yet to see one relationship where that was a good idea. You know, I was thinking about all the different reasons people start businesses and there are ones that we glamorize and there are ones that get absolutely no glory. So on the glamour side, it's like, oh, I'm going to solve a great problem. I'm going to clean the oceans. I'm going to get tourists into space. All these, you know, really ambitious things. Or it could be your passion or your calling. This is the thing I was meant to do. I am going to deliver green energy to the masses. I'm going to deliver solar panels. The other one we talk about, or we try not to talk about, but let's face it, wealth is one of them. We glamorize wealth. All the people on Instagram that you follow who are celebrities are wealthy, and on some level, we admire it. And also freedom, right? We glamorize the freedom you can get, maybe not while you're working your ass off, but certainly once you've made your millions, you can now get go on your yacht, you can get caught doing weird stuff with Jeffrey Epstein, those kinds of things. The things that get no glory are people who hate their jobs or bosses or corporate and just need to leave. They're tired of reporting to somebody else, especially someone they don't like or they don't respect or who doesn't respect them. Also, there are people who are unhirable. There are people who are uh, prisoners or were uh, ex-cons. I did a volunteer night and I actually wrote an article about this. Uh, there's an organization called Defy Ventures which teaches formerly incarcerated people how to run their own businesses. And it's absolutely necessary because a lot of companies won't hire people with criminal records. Now, there are some states that are changing that, but until that changes, there are no other options. That's why the recidivism rate, which is the rate at which people end up back in jail, is so high because they can't find a job. And a lot of times they're not trained for anything. Sometimes you could have a family business or expectations that you're going to go into the family business or there are expectations that you stay in whatever business that you're in to support your family or to pay bills or whatever, whatever it is that keeps you in that entrepreneurial venture. And sometimes it's necessity or bad economy. There are a lot of people throwing up shingles and LLCs just because they can't find a job. So that's the only thing they can do. So sometimes they start consulting or doing websites on the side or whatever it is. And sometimes it turns into a real business. What's interesting is the no glory entrepreneurs can end up more successful and more satisfied than the glamorous ones because they're born out of necessity and some sort of grizzled experience because they know what's on the other side. It's not this sort of wide-eyed deer in the headlights. Oh, I'm going to do these amazing things. No, there, you know, there's value in the darkness because when you get to the light, you appreciate it and you climb harder towards the light. The best analogy I could come up with, maybe there's a better one, is like an arranged marriage or a young marriage. Those people, when they meet, sometimes there's no sparks. It's like, all right, I expected better. But their trajectory is typically upward. 
their love and their passion develops over time because they essentially grow together. But relationships that are born out of passion, they fizzle out because they start here and then plummet because, hey, it's not as much fun anymore. We don't have sex as often. You know, he's sleeping with my sister, those kinds of things uh, that can happen. So which trajectory is better? Something like that happens with these no glory entrepreneurs. Now, there is one group of entrepreneurs I've never, ever in my life have been able to figure out. And those are people who leave corporate only to serve them in an external capacity and essentially do the same thing they would have done in corporate with all the same rules and all the same restrictions, but without the stability and security. I, I, I don't know, maybe it's just better to do that for yourself, but I just don't get it. Why not just take the big salary and the comfy office or whatever it is, the work from home desk and, and you know, a giant monitor and call it a day? Maybe someone can explain it. Sliced cheese, like that pre-sliced supermarket cheese, is the closest thing to alchemy, which is the creation of gold from air, society has ever known. They discovered a way to string together a bunch of polymers to credibly simulate food that people will pay for. It is genius, especially those, I, I guess it's craft Singles or whatever. They're not even milk, a lot of those. They're, they're made from oil. It's basically a byproduct of what you just filled your car with. In fact, you should be able to throw craft Singles into your car and drive another 30 miles till you get to the next gas station. Anyway, this is the greatest alchemy because those things are plasticky and horrible. The other thing that occurred to me is the single most profitable word, maybe in the history of the English language, certainly in the last 10 years, is the word organic. It single-handedly raised prices of hundreds of billions of products, of food products. And sometimes by 20% or more, sometimes it costs double to get the organic version without anyone questioning whether they need to get the organic, if it really gives them any benefit or discerning how that label was earned because there's some sketchy uh, labeling out there too. So it's crazy to think that one word has single-handedly removed so much wealth from consumers and handed it over to companies. It is pure genius. Can you come up with that next word that's going to do that same thing? That's your challenge. A guy named Jeff Morris, Jeff Morris Jr. to be exact, he tweeted, I've reached that life stage where I click on Instagram ads and actually buy things. So I responded, I just look it up on Alibaba, buy a pallet of the generic from China and start my own Instagram competitor with better videos. What you'll notice, and this is an exercise for you to, to do if you're an Instagrammer, when you see those ads, all those different products on there, every single one of them is a rebranded product from Alibaba. You can go to alibaba.com and I guarantee you, you will find whatever they're selling for $14.99 for 12 cents each, but you have to buy a pallet. You have to buy enough to fill uh, like a stadium. Not really, you, you have to buy a lot of them, but it's fascinating to me how people have created that as a business. Now, um, the old business used to be the Alibaba to eBay pipeline. But the new business is they're bypassing eBay because the prices are too low and also eBay's too ghetto. So they're totally bypassing it and they're going right to Instagram because on Instagram, everything is pretty, everyone is beautiful and they know if they dress it up the right way, they put the right model in there and they say the right words and they uh, press the right buttons emotionally, they can charge you probably a hundred times more than it costs on Alibaba, probably 10 to 30 times more than they would have gotten on eBay. And listen, it's a great business opportunity. If you want to do that, that is a legit business model that a lot of people are, are using. I have never, ever in my life begrudged 
any person's success. I don't even think about it. I am happy when my friends are successful and I am 1000% indifferent when people I don't know are successful, whoever they may be, famous or not. But there is this one guy named Salt Bay. He is the only person, this douche, is the only person whose success I actually detest. I hate it. He, all he does is sprinkle salt off his elbow and he has millions of followers. I don't know if it's ironic. I don't know if it's for real. I don't know if it's women who want to have sex with him, but we are a month away from him sprinkling paprika off his dick. This guy is the worst. Look at this video. Look at this video and tell me this is a guy you don't want to see fail. Please tell me, this is every douchebag in the club. <laughs> and and listen, uh, like I said, I don't wish ill on him, but <laughs> I do not want him to be successful. That's just how I feel. I'm sorry, I wanted to be honest with you. Somehow I have less disdain for OJ and Madoff, and I have no explanation for that, I just do. Anyway, thanks for joining. That's all for this episode. Tell a friend, share with others. I'll be putting some clips up and there'll be tons of pre-releases and bonus material for subscribers on Patreon. So go on Patreon and support the show, patreon.com forward slash McFuture. That's it. I'm Steve Factor. See you next time on the McFuture. And finally, what do you got to go through to fight the pandemic? At some point, if you look like you're in a Mel Brooks space themed movie just to stop COVID, choose COVID <laughs> because at some point, what life are you leading and who are you attracting? There is no woman on earth who is going to look at this guy or if he's gay, no man and say, oh yeah, this is the man for me. This guy is wearing basically a full on helmet that is strapped around his, uh, his chest. I, you know, maybe it's not COVID related. Maybe he's an alien and he cannot breathe or handle Earth's atmosphere.